we all have situational boldness. We're bold and confident in certain areas, and we have situational hesitation. The problem is when we have situational hesitation, we are least bold when it matters the most. Today, we're welcoming Fred Joyle. He's an author, speaker, and entrepreneur. And if I need to say one thing to give you guys an idea of who this man is and some of his entrepreneurial chops, he's the co-founder of 1-800-DENTIST. Now, if you were born sometime beyond the last decade, you absolutely know that. I don't remember the last time I saw a commercial, but I'm telling you, I said that to my wife. I'm interviewing Fred Joyle. We're going to have a conversation about some boldness and super boldness in his new book that's out. I said, but this guy's the co-founder of 1-800-DENTIST, and she just, I, that caught her attention. She gave me the raised eyebrows. He's currently the CEO of True Blue Social Smiles. He's previously written two best-selling books on the market that both landed on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And today we're going to talk about being super bold, going from underconfident to charismatic in 90 days. His humble brags, he once beat Sir Richard Branson in chess. Can't wait to get into the story behind that. He was also a question on Jeopardy. And if that sounds like weird English, just hang on. I'm sure he'll share the story. He's an avid cyclist. He's a below average tennis player and an even worse golfer in his own language. So today, welcome, Fred. I'm really excited to get to talk to you and hear this message. Me too, Adam. Let's get to it. Right on. Before we jump into the meat, because you know what, what we're doing on the Revolutionary Freedom Podcast is bringing the experience of living a lifestyle day in and day out of internal peace, contentment, getting rid of frustration, and living our authenticity. We do that well enough over time. It's like a spectrum. It's not a light switch. Over time, we will enter into that revolutionary freedom. And one of the things that you specialize in that I'm really excited to get to talk to you because I have dug into your content and we share some colleagues in the business world. And as I've seen that, I'm excited to get this message for myself as well. So being super bold, give us the idea of where you're going with this and how we can help this audience today. The best place to start is that I grew up as a, an incredibly shy person. It was extremely frustrating to me because I missed tons of opportunities and fun and job promotions and relationships. It made me angry because I couldn't figure out what to do about it because I thought bold people are born that way because I would see them do stuff and I went like, why do they not process rejection like I do? Over the years, I just changed myself by emulating bold people and figuring out what they did. And then eventually I figured out I can teach this the first thing that happened is I was talking to a group of high school kids about boldness being a superpower. And I said, the sooner you learn this in your life, the better your life will be when you are not stopping yourself from trying new things and taking risks and letting rejection bounce off you because it doesn't mean anything. It's not about you most of the time. And they just said, yeah, that's wonderful. How? <laughs> and I thought, I've got to figure out how I did it. And so that's what the book became is a created a systematic way that somebody could do what I did in a much more accelerated way from wherever they are, from however introverted they feel or shy they feel. I've had people who did my workshop who said, I thought it was pretty bold till I did this workshop. And I realized I could up my game considerably. And I'm still doing it. I'm constantly expanding my comfort zone, trying new levels of boldness all the time. It becomes this wonderful lifelong journey because great things happen much more than you expect. Bold people actually sort of trust in the discovery. They don't necessarily even know what the outcome is going to be. They just take action and, and roll with what comes. There's a phrase that stuck out to me when you were talking about being a child and thinking, why don't they process rejection the way that I do? And I connect with that a lot. I seem to have had a past in my life where even to this point, it's still something that I'm not grown out of. And I don't know if you can grow out of this, but I seem to internalize into my identity, absorb into my identity, rejection when it's a little bit close to home or it's someone's opinion about something personal of mine. You know, I've been in outside sales. I did outside sales for a long time. I've went door to door. I've done these things. That rejection didn't bother me. I was good with that. I got good in, in those situations. So help me understand some thoughts around that. And if you have a method that we can use, 
you do have a strong framework. I don't know if that's a good time to get into it, but take the reins. We can jump into one part of it. My framework, my method is called the PRIDE method. There's five steps to it. It's an acronym for preparation, relaxing, insight, dosage, and everyday action. I'll go into the, each of them. But what we just talked about is in building your boldness pathway and building your boldness muscle, because it builds like a muscle. There's some key insights in life. One of them is that nobody is thinking about you anywhere near as much as you think they are. They're thinking about themselves. You have stuff that happened to you that you cringe about every time you think about it. 20 years later, you're still cringing. I call them cringeworthy moments. Everybody else that was there doesn't remember. Or if they do, they think it's funny. They don't think it's a big deal. Mm. I'm going to get into something very deep here and realize that many of your reactions that you think are natural reactions are actually choices. Like to be irritated by something is a choice. You say, no, no, that baby crying behind me on the plane is irritating. No, it's not. You're being irritated. You're allowing yourself to be irritated. It is not by definition irritating. The baby's doing what it should be doing. It's saying, my ears hurt and I don't speak English. And if you empathize with the mom who's stuck with this baby for the next five hours and hoping the baby goes to sleep, you can shift from irritation to compassion. Another example is embarrassment is a choice. You can choose to be embarrassed or not. I could be at dinner and I could spill wine on my shirt. I could be on a first date or something like that. And I spill wine on my shirt, nice red wine. I could be like, oh, no, and I'm so embarrassed that I can barely finish the meal and I can't wait to get home and change the shirt or something like that, or I'm trying to cover up. Or I could just say, this is why my dry cleaner loves me. And the other person says, wow, he chose not to be embarrassed by that. (laughs) He chose not to let that bother him because we all have this belief that we need to be perfect when none of us is perfect. But we get embarrassed because we're not perfect. It's like, why not just be human? Now, my favorite story of this is a good friend of mine on stage, a great public speaker. She's got like a thousand people in the audience and she's striding across the stage and one of her high heels breaks. And there's like a gasp in the audience, right? Because they're like horrified for her that this has happened on stage. So she looks down, kicks off her shoes and says, well, I guess I got to start spending more than 30 bucks on shoes from now on. The whole place falls out laughing, right? Because there's so much tension and she releases it because she chose not to be embarrassed. She chose to use it to be funny. And she owned them at that point. That's that level of charisma that I'm talking about in the book that you can reach where you can make these choices all the time about your flaws, your vulnerability, the mistakes, bad things that happen to you. I've walked on stage and had all sorts of things happen to me over the years. And when you roll with it, one, you stay relaxed. You can choose to take on the rejection as a definition of you or not when most likely it's not, because we're judging people all the time, right? Human beings, by our nature, we have to evaluate people as a threat or an ally, right? Essentially, that is our lizard brain reaction. So we have all of these biases and all of these things built into ourselves. So I see a guy with a man bun, I just automatically say, that looks stupid. And then I talk to women and go like, oh, man, but I love that man, but it's like, really? (laughs) I met a guy once he was like inked up. And I thought this guy's like a biker or something like that. The way he looks all in leathers and stuff. He was a software programmer. He was the gentlest, most open-minded person I had met like in months. And I just went, wow, I was 180 degrees from who my first judgment was. So when you realize that you're doing it and you're wrong, realize that everybody who's doing it about you is wrong. They're doing it with no information. 
So don't take it on. What bold people do is they have a very small group of people whose opinions really matter to them. And the rest, they say, I don't worry about that. That's none of my business. It could or could not be accurate, but I care about these people. And I, I tell people, sit down and make a list of all the people in your life and who you interact with and give them a score on how much their opinions should matter to you. Mm. And then all of a sudden you realize it's five or six people that you give a nine or a 10 to. And then there's a whole bunch of people that you say, wow, this person's a one. And yet I worry about what she says to me. That is such a practical thing to do. And then you write it down and now your logical brain, which likes to explain away all the emotion, can look at that and have something to buy into and a reality to settle in. Yeah. These are the shifts you can make because one of the beliefs we have in life is that we need to appear perfect. And that just stops us. The other insight that's really key is when you ask people what's holding you back in life, what's stopping you? They've got a litany of things. Oh, it was my education, the teachers I had. It was the neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, it was my parents, you know. Uh, it's, it's my ethnicity. It's the economy. It's my gender. And you know who's stopping you? What's stopping you more than anything else? You. You're the one stopping you. Most of the time, bold people never stop themselves. This seems to connect with another thing that you said that caught my attention, where you said bold people choose not to take on that definition of themselves regarding someone else's rejection or someone else's opinion. Yeah, it's a gradual thing, but it comes down to hearing that voice. And I have a bunch of exercises in my book that have you start to hear that voice that's telling you, because we have good voices and that, you know, we don't just have one voice in our head. There's a whole group of people. There's the critic and there's the cheerleader and there's the analyst. And they're all based on stuff that's happened to us or stuff that either expanded us or inhibited us. None of us have perfect parents. Many of our parents had some really bad information. Yeah. That based on their own lives and their own pain and their own fears, Parents are great at transmitting fears to their children. I worked with dentists for decades. And pediatric dentists, when they get a, a child into the chair for the first time, if the parent isn't in the room, they can have that kid totally relaxed and comfortable and start a relationship with a dentist in a positive way that will last their whole lives. If the parent's in the room, the parent goes, don't be nervous. Don't be scared. It's not going to hurt that much. And the dentist is just going, just get out of the room. Be quiet. The kid's not scared. The yep. kid's not worried about pain. All right. I have a way of making this kid comfortable, but I can't do it with you transmitting your fear. That's really something. This definition thing is sticking in my head. You said we're the ones that get in our own way and there's really no other thing that does. And we're using the definitions that others have given us based on no information. Yeah. What's the next step we got here? The smarter you are, the more you're able to come up with the worst case scenarios in your head. And that's why you stop yourself. So what you do is hesitate. And this is the core of what I help people with is to, to recognize you're not shy. You're not inhibited. You're just hesitating when you should step up or speak up or walk across the room and introduce yourself. Take a risk, take action, stop playing it safe. I mean, do you really want it to be on your tombstone? She played it safe the whole way. Boldness is about expanding your comfort zone, but your comfort zone is not a goal. It's a place to restore yourself, to go back out into the world and live a fulfilling, satisfying life. That's all I want people to do is not stack regrets. Because when you stop yourself, when you hesitate, instead of an experience, you get a regret. Because these windows of opportunities close. You see an actor you really wanted to meet, somebody you really admire, and you want to just go over and talk to her, and you want to tell her about the movie that she made that really changed your life. And you hesitate, and all of a sudden, three other people walk up and start asking for autographs, and the window closes. That's a metaphor for thousand situations in life. I want to 
quit my job and start a business. You have to believe you can start a business and survive failing at that because odds are you're probably going to fail. Every entrepreneur I know has two or three failures under their belt before they have the success. And everybody goes, look at you. You just, you just locked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After I burned a million dollars in two other directions, I locked out. But that's the idea to realize that the windows of opportunities are closing and our hesitation is keeping us from doing it. You've seen salespeople, somebody hangs up on them and they can't dial again. They got to go to the snack room and they got to have a cup of coffee and they got to go have a cigarette and they got to walk around the block. That's why salespeople smoke. They're avoiding prospecting. Creative avoidance. Yeah. <laughs> the idea is to catch yourself and say, I hear the voice that's stopping me. I love catching like where the voice came from. Like, where did I get this belief? I'll say, oh, mom, yeah, you believe this because mm -hmm. this was your fear and you were trying to protect me. So you embedded this belief in me and it's doing me no good. And it probably protected me when I was eight years old or something like that. Yeah. And that's true of a lot of the things that protected us when we were young that we have to abandon as we get old. Let's say someone's been in their job, maybe their corporate job, their office job. She's 33 years old. Maybe she hasn't had a promotion in three or four years, been overlooked. A couple of newer people came in, rose up a position or two faster. She's very qualified. That's why they give her three different hats to wear. But they keep her on that lower pay scale from where the company knows that she deserves to be. What's a step or two you could give her to where she could get excited about going to try this when she's at work or maybe at home to prepare herself to go after to get what she's owed or maybe make that decision down the road of having to leave? She has to say to herself, how long do I want to keep doing this? How many years have gone by that I've tolerated this? What if I'd like to stop tolerating it right now? End that tolerance now. Because what happened is, is human beings can get used to anything if they do it long enough. That happens a lot of times in jobs. What she's going to say, she's got to do the first step of the pride method, which is prepare. Two parts of preparation. What's stopping me? What do I believe that's stopping me? And how do I just let that go enough to go and say, I am looking for a substantial raise that needs to happen in the next two weeks, or I am going on LinkedIn and I'm going to start to look for a job that pays that. And I love working here, but I want to be compensated according to my worth. And I want to be promoted on a scale according to my extra and added contribution over the years. You've prepared what you're going to say. You rehearse it just like you and I, if we're going to give a lecture, we just don't go out and hope we think of something. No way. And then one that relaxes you. But the other thing about relaxing, which is the R in the pride method, is if you just breathe, you can relax yourself. Before I go on stage, I got a big audience and a, like 60 foot stage and stuff like that. It's a little intimidating. I'll take three slow, deep breaths backstage. And what happens is the energy that was anxiety turns into energy that is eagerness to get out there, to bring my full self to the stage. I've turned anxiety into energy just by using my breath. And when you do it and you realize you're in control of it, because you can feel the anxiety. Anxiety is very specific in terms of how it feels in your body. And then when you just breathe your way through it and you say, wow, I reduced it by 30, 40, 50%. I am in control of my state. That relaxes you even more. Yep. Now, when you go on stage, you're fully energized. You haven't relaxed yourself into like a stupor. You're bringing energy out there rather than anxiety. So now your brain works, your memory works because you're in a heightened state, but you're not in an anxious state, which kills your memory. Mm. So before you walk into the boss, you've prepared what you're going to say. You've taken three deep breaths. You've made sure that he or she has time to talk to you. Like you're not just knocking on the door. Can I ask you? Because you, you hit them at the wrong time. You've not prepared. 
you're hoping that it's the right time instead of knowing that it's the right time. Mm, that's good. And then the insight is I am stopping me and I am no longer going to stop me. And I am going to be bold enough to see what happens. And I'm not bluffing. I am going to start looking for another job because life is too short. This is a huge insight. Life's too short to let somebody else decide what you're capable of. And that's what most people are doing. They're letting somebody else decide what they're capable of. I decide what I'm capable of. Bold people decide what they're capable of and what they want to become capable of by trying it, trying and failing. The boss may say, look, you're not getting a promotion. You're not getting a raise. You say, thank you for letting me know that instead of me spending two more years hoping you're going to reward me. Now I know you're never going to. So that's the realization. You say, I want that. That is the outcome I want. I want clarity. I don't want to raise. I don't want a promotion. Anywhere near as much as I want clarity mm -hmm. so I can take control of my life. It's too short to stack regrets. It's too short to not have the career you want, the business you want, the relationships you want. Because when you don't get to that stuff, we all know it as we get older. A week turns into a month, turns into a year, turns into a decade. And it could be a bad marriage. It could be a bad job. It could be your health. Yeah. Any of those things. You say, well, I don't, I'm too fat to go to the gym. Well, guess what? You're not going to get skinnier not going to the gym. Yep. <laughs> you know? yep. So put on the tights and look in your mirror and you say, wow, I look huge in these tights. I better get to the gym. And you know who's in the gym? Really people in shape and really people not in shape yep. who said, I am going to change this. Yep. There's a guy that I like to follow in the mixed martial arts world. Used to be a fighter and now a more YouTuber commentator. But have you heard of the name Chael Sonnen? No. So Chael, he's got this phrase that he says all the time about fighters that take all this time off. And then they come back and he gives his opinion. He says, listen, you do not get better by not doing something. <laughs> you don't get better at something by not doing it. So I love that. This reminds me of another piece that I saw of yours that caught my attention. You talk about stop second guessing yourself. Stop second guessing your intuition and trust it. So in this moment, this seems relevant. Is there a simple step or a simple mental paradigm that we can consider to stop second guessing the core of our intuitions, which maybe hesitation can even come after that point and going, oh, no, we just don't trust it. There's two things that when you understand them for the first time, when you realize that it's just that you're hesitating and that there are causes that are unrelated almost to the hesitation that aren't directly about that situation. Yeah. It's embarrassment from another situation or somebody laughed at you for that or you failed at this and that. There's a lot of people that talk about embracing failure. And I'm a big believer in it because what I saw was bold people, failure is just information for them. It's a stairway to their dream. Yep. When you understand that hesitation is driving it, the other thing you want to realize, it's a secret that I figured out very late, mostly by forcing myself to be bold, is that most people say, well, I would be bolder if I were more confident. That's why I'm not taking bold action. It's actually the other way around. Bold action is where your confidence comes from. Bold people take action all the time with things they're not confident about their capability or how it's going to go or anything. They just say, I'm going to go. I'm going to go be uncomfortable and see what happens because that will make me stronger. And I move the analogy to exercise. And I ask people, what's the most important rep when you're exercising? And most people will say, well, the last one. It's actually the one you can't do. That's the most important mm -hmm. one. And this is a great analogy that changes how you embrace failure. When we exercise, that's all we're doing is aiming for failure. We're aiming for the rep we can't do. We're aiming for two more seconds of the sprint that we can't do because that's where all the growth comes from. Let's face it. If you're not into personal growth, 
your life's going to be gradually declining and boring and unsatisfying and unfulfilling forever. You have to develop this desire to get better. And don't be in a relationship with somebody who's not into personal growth if you are, because you're going to be in hell. Yep. The recipe for disaster. And they are not changing. I'm sorry. This is who I am. It's just like when somebody says, I'm an introvert. I dislike it so much when they say that. I say, no, no, you have shy behavior at certain times. You're not shy with your family. You're not shy with your close friends. You're not shy with the, the gamers. We all have situational boldness. We're bold and confident in certain areas, and we have situational hesitation. The problem is when we have situational hesitation, we are least bold when it matters the most. What I want people to do is build their muscle, their boldness muscle gradually so that when it matters most, bold is their default mode. And I want to say that again. You want to build your boldness muscle so that when the situation comes up that really matters, bold is your default mode, not hesitation. And the only way you do that is gradually. This is the D in the pride method. Control the dosage of the experience. Build your boldness muscle when it matters less and less. Take little moves out of your comfort zone, not gigantic moves. This sounds like the process that would help us begin trusting in that intuition. Yeah. We're circling all the way back to that idea. Something's pulling you in that direction, and that's your intuition. And something's forcing you to hesitate. Those are your barrier beliefs and your self-talk. Mm. And you have to say, yes, I hear the self-talk. I'm aware of the barrier beliefs, but I'm taking action anyway. Circling back to this idea, bold action is what's going to build your confidence. You could fail. That's okay. My book is full of exercises that aim for failure. Smile at 10 people a day until somebody doesn't smile back. Because my reaction is, oh, they don't like me, or they think I'm funny looking, or whatever it is. Or how about the other 20 things it could be? Worst day of their life. They don't smile at anybody. They got bad teeth. They're in a hurry. Any number of things that you don't have to take on. So you do these exercises to build your boldness muscle when it doesn't matter at all if somebody smiles back. And you find out, you go like, wow. I really care. Why do I care about a complete stranger not smiling at me? How ridiculous is that? One of the great exercises that builds your boldness muscle is to talk to a stranger every day. And the easiest way, the preparation is, well, what am I going to say to a stranger? A compliment. You're just going to find something about them that you want to compliment. That shirt looks great on you. I don't know where you got it, but it just brings out your eyes. And then go. It's a drive-by compliment. You're not looking for anything in return. But what you get is you made somebody feel good about themselves. Yeah. And you end up feeling pretty good about yourself. I do it constantly. I'm at Starbucks and I'll get a lot latte. I'll take it and then I'll come back to the barista. And who comes back normally? The complainer. The complainer's right. <laughs> yeah. So I come back and I just say, this is absolutely perfect. And you can see the change in them because yeah. they've had so many complaints and so many people that just said that just took the cup and didn't say anything. Be that voice of upliftment and watch the impact that you have. And what that does, it builds your boldness muscle because you say, I can talk to strangers. The other thing about preparation this is really important. Here's what I do because I want to defeat two things. I want to defeat my inhibition about talking to strangers and I want to stop judging people. So if I look at somebody and I think they have like a really extreme tattoo, okay, clearly they got that for a reason. So instead of saying, wow, you shouldn't have spent that much money on that, which is my judgment voice. I say, wow, that ink looks fabulous. And you know what happens? My judgment goes away of them yep. because they say, oh, thank you so much. You know, I saved for like six months to be able to get it. And I looked at, I interviewed like 10 artists before I let this person do it. You made them feel good about themselves. 
And you get rid of that judgment that you don't need to have about people. Yeah. Every time you do it and you change somebody, you become addicted to it and you say, why am I, why am I hesitating to talk? And then eventually it's like, why am I hesitating when it matters? I don't want to hesitate. I want bold to be my default mode. My default mode is I'm going to take bold action and see what happens. Because what bold people know is that 99% of the time, nothing bad happens. Yep. We're great. Like I said, going back to, we're great at thinking of the worst case scenario. We're terrible at calculating the odds of that happening. We think, oh, they're going to laugh at me. They might. Is that even bad? Do you have to take it on? Maybe they're going to think, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting that he would do that. Like if you just walk into a chocolate shop and just yell at the top of your lungs, I love chocolate. Bunch of people in the, they're in a chocolate shop. They're going to say, yeah, I do too. I'm not, I may not yell it, but uh, that's why I'm here. I, yeah. I love chocolate. And you realize like you didn't die doing it. And you just, you did something bold where it didn't matter. If everybody thought you were an idiot in the whole place, who cares? Yeah. And that builds your boldness muscle because you're aiming for people to think you're ridiculous when it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's funny, which is, would be the failure point. You know, it's yeah. funny because like you're mentioning using the Starbucks examples was something I found that can help lend to the boldness is that when you do those things and give a compliment here and there, an honest compliment, not flattery, you realize over time how much light you're adding to where the environments that you're in. And then you're like, wait a second, I'm actually an asset. Wherever I go, I can be an asset and raise the place. I wanted to mention one more thing that you had talked about, and I want to actually affirm the example you're using. This is a very practical thing. You talk about smiling at people as you pass them, maybe saying hello at the same time, right? We discovered that I was affected by PTSD post-combat in 2012-13. I degraded it over a couple of years because I didn't understand that I was supposed to be working with that and doing something different, right? We, we got there, but it took a few years. But it did degrade enough to where my natural charisma or my natural happy-go-lucky personality was really stifled. And for me, I had to learn that one of my triggers was whenever I was around other people I didn't know. So strangers became a significant trip point for me. When before I would laugh and joke with them, especially in nursing, I saw hundreds of people a day. I was never shy of anybody. But then this happened. So I started walking in my neighborhood. The hat is down, the glasses are on, and the eyes are at the pavement. That's not who I was. This happened for a couple of years where I literally felt scared. And then over time, I don't know where I picked it up, but I did start raising the eyes up and I would make eye contact with somebody as they go by. And it started with a half grin and a head nod. And that's where I started. And then over time, it got to the point where I'd smile and say, hey, good morning. You're just passing someone on a pathway. And then I discovered it would bother me if somebody had a straight face, a scowl look and didn't respond at all, which was actually during COVID with the explosion of negative media, it was probably half the people that were like that. The worst I've ever seen it. Yeah. And over time, I'm to the point now where the person, if they don't smile, whatever, I now have come to the realization, I say a little prayer for them, a little heartfelt energy toward them, man. I hope their day gets better. Have no idea what they're dealing with, but there's no way that that look was for me this morning. Couldn't have been. Yeah. I love that. No, and, and there's there's a light that starts to come from you. And this is really what charisma really is, is that you feel comfortable putting your full self out there to people, regardless of how they're going to respond to it. But it's also because you've learned that most of the time there's a positive response. And that's all you're looking for. The really shy people that act like they need everybody to like them. It's like, that's an impossible goal to aim for. How about three really good friends? That's a great life. Yes. Okay. I've got tons of good friends, but there are people that I treasure and consider myself very lucky. I don't need everybody to like me. I don't need everybody in the audience when I'm speaking to think I'm brilliant. 10% of them are going to think I'm an idiot, that I'm full of it. I, I can't fix them because they have a bias because I have yellow Nikes on, right? They can't hear a word I say because they think I'm dressed like a clown. 
and that's them. That's their thing. And the 10 people who think I'm absolutely brilliant, they're probably not right too, but I appreciate them thinking that, you know, um, I just, but if somebody comes up to me and says, this is just what I needed to hear right now in my life, or even better, I run into them like a year later and they say, I was at your, your lecture in Chicago. I heard you say this thing that hesitation was eating my dreams one bite at a time. And it's, I started catching myself hesitating and I don't anymore. That shift happened because you said that to me right when I needed to hear it. And, and, and then they just tell me about this new trajectory in their life. That makes it all worthwhile because that's huge. I'm saying, I wish I knew it 40 years ago, <laughs> you know, yeah. took me way too long to figure it out, but at least I did. I'm not adding regrets to the stack anymore. Part of the big thing of, of your message is that you herald is everyday action. Yep. Is there a routine that somebody can build into their daily system if they have one? Or is this just a matter of when the opportunities arise, you have to start building the muscle by forming the reps, which is taking the action. The beauty of talking to strangers is unless you just work at home and never go out, the opportunity to talk to strangers appears all the time. And if you don't have an opportunity to meet strangers, you're going to work and it's always the same people, compliment somebody every day. Say, I'm not leaving work without having given some level of approbation or support or compliment to somebody. The other thing you can do is when somebody says in the elevator, they say, man, this elevator takes so long. And, and instead of saying, yeah, yeah, that's a, I don't know what the deal is with this. You say, you know what? It's reminding me I, I wanted to take the stairs today to get the exercise. So that's what I'm going to do from now on. So I'm grateful for the slow elevator. And they say, wow, you decided to not jump on the negative negativity train with me. And, it, and I love when people do that, when people do that to me, when I somehow are, am negative. Another great exercise is write down how many times a day you start a sentence with the words, I hate. I hate traffic. I hate this show. I hate this kind of food. I hate this restaurant. And you realize you're ascribing a very intense emotion to something yep. that doesn't merit it. How about I don't like it? Then you haven't given it the full juice of hatred. You're a Democrat. You can say, I hate Republicans. How about you disagree with Republicans? Because they're, they're people with their own belief systems that they arrived in their own way, just like you did. And guess yep. what? You've got just as many biases. They're just different. Yep. All you're doing is disagreeing. And here's an interesting thing. You might not be right. <laughs> if you run a business long enough, you realize you're guaranteed to be wrong 30 to 50% of the time. The 10% in your audience who you just struck home with just walked out the back door. I, I just <laughs> I just watched them leave the room. Yellow shoes. I possibly am not right. This guy's a total idiot. I'm out of here. <laughs> right, right. I am right all the time. People need to listen to me. <laughs> you know what that is? It's pure fear. It hurts so much to be wrong. And I was like this. I understand it completely. I would make up answers to not be wrong. And then I suddenly realized I would always try to have an answer for everything. And I eventually started to say, I don't know. It was incredibly empowering. Yes. I started getting comfortable with being able to do that after and many other tools after. But the spark for me was reading How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Yeah. That was like the first, second or third self-help book I ever read in my life. Now I was almost 30. I read that book and I wasn't three chapters in before I realized, oh my gosh, no wonder so many people don't like me. But I had charisma. They'd think I'm funny. I'm the jokester and, and got along with people. But after a while of getting too much close contact, because I'm the guy that's going to complain and the elevator's taking too long and be cynical about everything. But How to Win Friends <laughs> woke me up to that. Yeah. You have to be able to hear yourself with an impartial viewpoint and say, really, do I hate traffic or do I dislike traffic or is it a challenge to deal with it every day? 
degrade the intensity of it and eventually you realize I need an appropriate level. You can take all sorts of things and reverse them. I used to hate stretching after working out. And every trainer I ever had said, you need to do stretches. And I said, like, I really don't want to hate stretching. I don't want to do it. So I said, well, I'm getting older. I'm getting stiffer and less flexible. I got to start stretching. So what I did is I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start saying to myself, stretching's coming up. I love stretching. It's my favorite part of my workout. Even though it wasn't true at all. Three weeks, my favorite part of the workout. Mm. That's all it took. That's how reprogrammable we are. We get so attached to these beliefs that there's no reason to be, they're not helping us. Yep. So why be so attached to them? I hate nosy people. I mean, the list goes on. It's like, really? Maybe they're just curious. Maybe they're yeah. interested in you. How about, how about liking somebody who's interested in you? Yep. In what's going on in your life. For me personally, I have to literally come up with a better reason than I don't like it, than my complaint in order for me to do it. So the benefit has to outweigh the inconvenience or the pain in the ass of it. For me, a big one, I'm telling you, is going to bed at an adult mature hour and not staying up and watching any kind of mash reruns or watching YouTube MMA clips. The way that I feel great the next day is by getting that bedtime done. And I want to feel strong and powerful and not weeks, tired or anxious. So I got to find the benefit. When you start to take an impartial view and say, is the behavior actually serving me yep. or is it preventing me from having a more healthy life, a more satisfying life, a more enjoyable life? I mean, I, I, I love going to comedy clubs and there's always this guy not laughing at anything. And then there's the other person that's laughing at everything even the silly stuff, even the only moderately stuff, she's just laughing away. And I just, I want to say to the guy, who do you think is having a better time here? Her <laughs> or you? Because you're so busy judging that it's not funny enough for you to laugh at. Why? Because you'd love to do stand up, but you're too afraid. So you have to say, this guy's not good. This guy's not funny. She's got lousy jokes. I'm not laughing at that. Why? Because they're being bold and you don't feel bold enough to do it. So you have to judge them. Instead of bold, he goes bitter. Yep. And that makes him feel good about himself, but it doesn't pay off. Yeah. That's really great. Man, do you have any other cherries to put on top of this? The thing about boldness is the sooner you learn it, the more impactful it will be on everybody around you. When boldness becomes your default mode, you realize that there's all these unexpected things, the universe or God, God put you here to be alive for a finite amount of time. And we're all in the game of life, but we don't know how long the coach is going to let us play. That's the big difference. So play full out now because you could be benched at any moment. We all feel like, well, I'm not going to die tomorrow. It's like, you don't know that at all. This whole idea is live every day like it's like your last. I think that's kind of nutty. Easily can be. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> How about you got to build stuff that lasts, uh, that takes a little bit longer than a day and just stop entertaining yourself all the time. Because if it's your last day on earth, mm. you know, if, it's, if you're living like your last day, you're going to eat really badly uh, <laughs> and watch a lot of TV and drive like a maniac and do all sorts of stuff. That's what I would do if I knew it was my last day. I'm not going to, well, I think I'll read a newspaper. No, so yeah. gonna, Everywhere I go, no. make chocolate chip in my arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People say carpe diem, seize the day. I contradict that because most of the time you don't have all day to seize the opportunity. Most of these things are moments. These are windows that open and close. So Carpe momentum, seize the moments, know that hesitation is eating your dreams. And when you stop, when you step up, when you speak up, your boldness muscle gets stronger. And then when it matters most, when you have to give a eulogy for a friend and you dislike public speaking, or you got to stand up to a bully that's bullying somebody else, or 
you want to do this act of kindness, but you don't know if that person's going to receive it well, and you do it anyway. You want that boldness and you want to try stuff because the books that they have uh, where they interview people in their last days, their regrets are all about the stuff they didn't do, the stuff they didn't try, the stuff they didn't fix because of their entrenched beliefs and behavior and their fears and playing it safe and trying to stay in their comfort zone. They don't regret the mistakes and the failures. Any of that stuff doesn't matter to them. They just say, you know, I wish I had quit that job a lot sooner. I wish I'd quit that job. I wish I'd fixed my relationship with my brother instead of holding a grudge until the last two weeks of my life. And we both realized how stupid it was. Deliberately denying yourself of love. That's what Oof. so many people are doing. Jeez. If people don't understand the value that they're getting from you in this hour, you normally have to pay a therapist over a period of 12 months to get the information and the content that you're explaining here in an hour. That's legit. Thank you. I hope that's true for some of your listeners. And the reality is when you realize that the only person you need permission from to have the life you want, to have the love you want, the career you want, the most adventurous, exciting, satisfying life, the only person you need permission from is you. So don't be waiting for permission from somebody else because they're busy and they're focused on themselves and what makes them happy in the moment. Bold people are never the ones stopping themselves. And because of it, the world opens up to them. God says, oh, you're stepping up. I got some surprises for you. I'll give you an example, specifically in my life, that was very powerful. I was taking my nephew to a concert a couple of weeks ago, and the concert got canceled. Like He was all excited about it. He's 15 years old. We were all bummed out about it. And then a young friend of mine, this is a very personal thing, but he, he got in a situation where his girlfriend got physically abusive with him to the point where he had her arrested. Mm. This was very hard for him. And instead of going to the concert, I spent the day and night with him, talking to him, talking him through this, and then sitting down and just watching TV and being with him. And I thought, what a gift that that concert was canceled because I was doing exactly what I ought to be doing. And that's the real bold life. When you give yourself permission and boldness and ability to do what you ought to do with your life. Man, that sounds like living authenticity. I absolutely love it. So someone's getting turned on by this. Where can they go to find you first? Should they grab the book first? Direct our people. You can go to my website, see some of the lectures I've done, read some more about me, book some time. If you want to talk about me doing a keynote, I love speaking to every type of audience, but get the book. The book is on Amazon. It's on Kindle and Audible and hardcover. It's me reading the book. So I'll be in your head <laughs> and keep on becoming bolder because that's where uh, the juice of life is especially for the people who are listening audio only podcasts right now, they're, they're likely working out doing some sort of physical training, right? Or they're in their car, the reframing on the hate, the traffic. This is my time that I don't get at home with my four kids to listen to audiobooks. right now. I'm listening to Matthew McConaughey's green lights. It's phenomenal. Use that car time, that traffic time, that workout time to listen to these types of things and begin practicing these because this is absolutely transformative material. I really appreciate your time today, Fred. Thank you, Adam. It was a joy to be here. Right on, brother. We'll talk soon.